I heard this story from Craig Rochelle, something that happened in the South years and years ago that there was this church really concerned with a bar in their community that they felt was really an evil for the people around there. And so the pastor started talking to his church and saying, let's, let's pray that God would close the doors of this place that's leading our people astray. And so they called a prayer meeting and people were praying, yes, God, like we, we don't want people drawn into this place that is so, so evil, pulling people away. And so they, they continued to pray and pray. Well, one night, lightning struck that bar and it burned to the ground. It's not the end of the story. What happened next is the bar owner sued the church saying that they caused his bar to get burned down. It's his business. He put all his life savings into this place. And then the pastor started saying, no, 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 no. We, we didn't cause that. And he's like, no, you, you prayed for this bar to get burned down. And so you're the cause of it. No, we didn't actually expect anything to happen. And then the judge is like, wait, 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 let me get this straight. I see a bar owner here who believes in the power of prayer and a pastor who doesn't. <laughs> and so the book is called The Christian Atheist. The idea is that sometimes people can look like they're a Christian, sound like they're a Christian, but really it's, they're closer to being an atheist in, in, their, in their true beliefs. They don't actually believe that God's going to do something. And so... Today we're going to talk a little bit about unbelief, a little bit about doubts. I was coming across this short little part in Mark's gospel in, in chapter 6 where Jesus and his disciples go back to his hometown of Nazareth. And if you haven't heard this before, some of us already read this uh, leading up to Easter. And so it was part of our reading, and it's just a short few verses, but what happened in, in that chapter is that Jesus actually was surprised in their unbelief. What happened is, this sounds strange coming from Jesus, but he said that he couldn't do any miracles among them except to place his hands on a few sick people and heal them. And this is what's fascinating compared to a couple weeks ago when he was so amazed with the faith of a Roman officer, is in this, he was amazed at their unbelief. Then Jesus went from village to village teaching people. And, and so I found that so fascinating. We can go from someone who's kind of an outsider, who he's so impressed with their faith, to then people, including his own family members and people that saw him growing up. And he referenced a, a passage saying, you know, a prophet, he's... He's not really accepted in his own hometown among people that, that know him. And so today, really, the, the tension here and the need for us is that we believe in God, sure. But if we're honest, I bet most of us struggle with our, our faith to some degree. I, I bet that at least a small amount would say that, yeah, I, I do struggle with unbelief and, and we have our doubts. I love what Edwards said. He says that true faith is always aware of how small and inadequate it is. Understanding how little it can be, but we also know that faith the size of a mustard seed can do amazing things. And so a little preview of the passage that we're about to read is of this man who in his desperation replied to Jesus, I do believe, but help me overcome my unbelief. I do believe Jesus, but help me make up for that gap where I still have some unbelief. Can you help me overcome that? John Wesley put it this way. Although my faith be so small that it might rather be termed unbelief, yet help me. My faith is so small, you might actually call it unbelief, but would you help me anyway? Jesus helps us to overcome, and we can find hope in his helping hands. And so with that, we're going to go to the passage of the day, which is in Mark chapter 9. And really, for context, we're going from a mountaintop to a valley low. We're going from the transfiguration where Jesus and just the few you know, Peter, James, and John were up there. This miraculous thing happened, and then they come back, and this is where we pick up in chapter 9 verse 14, it says, when they returned to the other disciples, they saw a large crowd surrounding them, and some teachers of religious law were arguing with them. 
When the crowd saw Jesus, they were overwhelmed with awe, and they ran to greet him. What is all this arguing about, Jesus asked. One of the men in the crowd spoke up and said, Teacher, I brought my son so you could heal him. He's possessed by an evil spirit and won't let him talk. Whenever the spirit seizes him, it throws him violently to the ground. Then he foams at the mouth and grinds his teeth and becomes rigid. So I asked your disciples to cast out the evil spirit, but they couldn't do it. And Jesus said to them, you faithless people, how long must I be with you? How long must I put up with you? Bring the boy to me. So they brought the boy. When the evil spirit saw Jesus, it threw the child into a violent convulsion and he fell to the ground, writhing and foaming at the mouth. How long has this been happening? Jesus asked the boy's father. He replied, since he was a little boy, the spirit often throws him into the fire or into the water, trying to kill him. Have mercy on us and help us if you can. What do you mean, if I can? Jesus asked. Anything is possible if a person believes. The father instantly cried out, I do believe. But help me overcome my unbelief. When Jesus saw the crowd of onlookers was growing, he rebuked the evil spirit. Listen, you spirit that makes this boy unable to hear and speak, he said, I command you to come out of this child and never Enter him again. Then the spirit screamed and threw the boy into another violent convulsion and left him. The boy appeared to be dead. And a murmur ran through the crowd. And people said, he's dead. But don't miss this. But Jesus took the boy by the hand and helped him up to his feet. And he stood up. Afterward, when Jesus was alone in the house with his disciples, they asked him, why couldn't we cast out that evil spirit? And Jesus replied, this kind can be cast out only by prayer. And some manuscripts say, and fasting. So, Father, we come to you now with our, our, our faith and open hearts. And we want to be honest before you. You already know our hearts. You know our minds. And we want to use this as a, a, a moment to grow closer to you and, and for you to help us make up the difference from the amount of belief that we have so that we would have greater faith in you. We want to put our trust in you even now. So Holy Spirit, speak through this text and through me at this time. Uh, we want to receive it openly and leave this place changed, growing closer to you, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. David Smith calls this section ineffectiveness and misunderstandings. And Edwards calls this exact passage frail faith in a strong savior. And Eugene Peterson calls it there are no ifs. So this passage, it's really impressive what just happened. What just took place is what's called the transfiguration. And Jesus, again, he took Peter, James, and John up this high mountain to be alone and all of a sudden, they watched as his appearance was, was transformed, and this is incredible. All of a sudden, Elijah and Moses appeared uh, before them, and remember, Peter had this awkward thing of like, Lord, it's so great to be here. What can I, can I build you a shelter or something? Like, what can I do? He had no words for what was happening, and afterward, it was just Jesus alone there, and he mentioned how... Uh, not to tell anyone about this encounter until the Son of Man had risen from the dead. And so they're asking these questions. What could he mean by raising from the dead? What is all of this? And they ended up going down the hill and finding this situation where the rest of the 12, they had a situation. There was an argument that had broken out. Apparently, they had tried to intervene for this boy's son or for this, this father for his son. But for whatever reason, and this might end up being a two-parter, so we might find out the answer next week, but for some reason they couldn't do anything, and, and it didn't make sense, and so there was arguing going on, and this father was bold enough to actually speak up to Jesus and say, listen, 
what some would paraphrase is, in your absence, Jesus, I relied on your disciples and they let me down. I want to just say that again in, in case maybe you can relate. In your absence, I relied on your disciples and they let me down. Have you ever been there? Just me? But what I love is this encounter where the man saying, have mercy on us and help us if you can. And remember last week we talked about how Jesus does have compassion on people. But what that doesn't mean is that he just feels for people at a distance and say, man, that really stinks. Ugh, I feel sad about this father. He doesn't just do that and move on, does he? Jesus is moved with compassion. He's in motion to do something. And when this man said, if you can, remember Eugene puts it this way, there are no ifs. Jesus responds to say, what do you mean if I can? Jesus asked him this question to kind of draw out the faith that he has or doesn't. And what does he respond with? The father instantly cried out, I do believe, not the end of the sentence, but help me overcome my unbelief. That's the last thing we hear about the father in this scene, but I feel like that is a crucial turning point that we can relate to now. I, I do believe, God, I'm, I'm, I'm trying, but help me overcome that amount that doesn't seem to be adding up to the faith that is required for this particular situation. Some call this the most honest declaration of faith in the entire New Testament. I would agree. He's so honest with the amount and the lack of his faith. Timothy Keller puts it this way, I'm trying, but I'm full of doubts. Jesus, I'm, I'm trying, but I'm full of doubts. Can you help me overcome that? And so as I look at this passage, I see a couple things. I see doubts and destruction. That's the negative side. That's the tension that is throughout this, this passage. And if you think of it this way, doubt is a feeling of uncertainty. It's not just a thinking of uncertainty. It's actually a, a feeling. You feel doubt. If you've been there, you understand. Doubt is a feeling of uncertainty. And this father who has witnessed his son going through this since he was a young boy, he has a feeling of uncertainty. The disciples couldn't help. They let him down. But he's believing Jesus, if you can, help us. But there's a gap there because he feels uncertain. Now, destruction, you know all about that. In this exact translation, it says that the spirit often throws him into the fire or water trying to kill him. Others say trying to destroy him. What does destruction really do? Well, its purpose is defeat. We were just singing quite the opposite in the last song that actually death is defeated because of Jesus. But destruction's purpose against this boy is to defeat him and really his father too, to knock him down, which it did, but to get him to the point where it seems like he's beyond repair. That's the purpose of destruction. I love in John's gospel, Jesus has a word about this. He says in chapter 10, verse 10, easy one to remember, the thief's purpose is to what? To steal and kill and destroy. That's the thief's purpose. The thief's purpose is to steal and kill and destroy. But my purpose, Jesus says, is to give them a rich and satisfying life. And the true interpretation of that is for this life and the life to come. It's this everlasting life where everything you see in the universe will rust and decay and ultimately be beyond repair, but not with Jesus. And so he's saying that, yeah, the thief who might be using this spirit, and whether or not we think it's a spirit, whatever was happening with this boy, we believe it's a grand mal seizure. What Jesus is saying, yeah, the purpose of that is to destroy him, to knock him down so that it seems like he's beyond repair. But he's not beyond repair, not when I'm around. 
He's saying that my purpose is to give them a rich and satisfying life. And so the man who had that little bit of doubt, that feeling of uncertainty, that might be the highlight for us to relate, but we can also relate to the people who they see the boy who appeared to be dead, and perhaps he was, we don't know, we can't verify, but this murmur ran through the crowd as people said he's dead. But I love when a verse starts with, but Jesus. Verse 27 is this way. But Jesus took him by the hand, helped him to his feet, and he stood up. That's resurrection language, by the way. One of the reasons we were singing that song just a moment ago is because the words in the original language here, which would be Greek, there are a couple words within that short verse, verse 27, that's the same language about Jesus rising from the dead. The same language of after he breathed his last, but on the third day rose again, it's that same language. And so whether it just appeared like the boy was dead or not, the greater story here is that he did rise this boy from the dead. And even if that's not true, if this boy places his faith in him, one day that would be true. And so what's Jesus' response but to take the boy by the hand, raise him up to his feet so he could stand. Whereas this illness or this spirit, this one that was trying to destroy him, to knock him down beyond repair, Jesus says, no, I'm going to cast that away. I'm actually going to destroy the thing that was trying to destroy him. I think one of the themes here is that when it seems like we've exhausted all options, that we can find hope in Jesus. Do you believe that? I don't know if you've ever been there where it seems like you've exhausted all the options you can think of. You've tried everything. Have you been there? Have you been similar to this father who would say to God, in your absence, it feels like you're not close by, so I tried to rely on your disciples, or I tried to rely on your church, or I tried to rely on people who call on your name, but they let me down. I was thinking about this during the service, as often we're we're singing about faith and we're singing about how, God, you, you've never let me walk alone. Um, I, I've never been abandoned by you. There, there's things like this. Now, there are feelings similar to doubt being this feeling of uncertainty. You've probably been let down before. You don't have to raise your hand. That would be all of us probably. But I thought about it this way. Since I started following Jesus, there have been times where I felt let down by a prayer that I requested for him to answer and it didn't seem like he answered or something that I lifted up to him and it's like, how come it's going in the opposite direction? Is it just the pastor that's been there or anyone else can relate? So I thought about it honestly while we were singing and I could sing those songs with no problem, but I was thinking, no, you're right. Jesus has never let me down, but his people have. And that's hard. The disciples are here hearing from Jesus, you faithless people. What's not really in question here is the man's faith, as small as it is. Jesus is actually very patient to deal with this man and to help this son. But maybe this is a lesson for the disciples. Have you thought of it that way? He's actually not trying to teach the father here so much as he's trying to help the father. And by doing so, he's trying to help this crowd that was arguing and the disciples that are like, why couldn't we do this? This is a problem that Jesus can handle. And so to say it again, we can find hope. We can find hope in Jesus. And, and the way that I was thinking of it in this exact passage is this way. We can find hope in the helping hands of Jesus. If Jesus is going to bend down and take someone by the hand, you can be sure he can raise them up. And so, in relation to the doubts and the destruction here, here's what I want you to know, that Jesus can raise us from doubting to trusting. 
I've seen it happen to, to greater belief in him. Now, I just want to be clear on, on knowledge. I was saying to someone at the end of last service, the family service, if there's any goldfish in, in the seat around you, that's uh, it's not my bad. It was the disciples that were taking those buckets everywhere. I told them to clean it up. But I was saying to someone how, isn't it beautiful that a story like last week where Jesus feeds the 5,000, well, he used the disciples to do it. It wasn't just Jesus, was it? And the people had to have that need. What's beautiful is that it's in all four gospel accounts, children last week understood it didn't they the answer was d that's not the point but like they they could answer the trivia questions but isn't it beautiful that the more we learn about the bible the more we learn about god the older we become the further along in our faith we grow it seems like there's so much more that we don't know is it just me i feel that way but at the same time I've seen Jesus grow my own faith in him. I've seen, as I've been able to dive in and try to unpack scripture in a new way to be able to communicate it, not just for myself, but for for all of us, is that I feel so inadequate to do it. Not because I doubt, but because the amount of faith that I have, similar to John Wesley's words, although my faith be so small that it might be rather termed unbelief, yet help me. I feel that way quite often. Like, Jesus, I, I believe I'm going to sing this song. I'm going to mean it. I do mean it. But wow, my faith seems like it's about this high. Have you ever been there? But I feel like Jesus can raise our doubting to greater trust in him. The other thing is that Jesus, he raises us from destruction to resurrection. That's one of the great themes of of the gospel is that in the end, Jesus reverses destruction and destroys even death. So beyond this exact story, even if some of us might walk in the same shoes as this father or as this young boy who had dealt with it for so long, in the end, Jesus reverses destruction. Whereas everything seems like It's going to rust and decay and ultimately be knocked down beyond repair. But Jesus, he can take anything and anyone by the hand, raise them to their feet so that they stand up. Those that trust in him, our belief, the belief that I do have, small as it might be, that it might be termed unbelief, I do believe in the resurrection. I do believe that he's going to really reverse all of destruction's purpose because his plan is to give this rich and satisfying life for now and the life to come. So Jesus, he can raise us from doubting. He can raise us out of destruction. He can reverse destruction. He can destroy that which destroys, even death. And so the application point that I want us to think about for today And again, this is going to be a two-parter. We're going to look at it through a different lens for next week because I think there's just so much in this short passage. What I would recommend, that I also recommend for myself, is to be honest with Jesus. Do you believe he already knows your heart anyway? He knows what you're thinking. But there's something about when we're honest with ourselves with him. Have you found that? I find that quite freeing. Similar to this man, I do believe, but help me overcome my unbelief. That's an honest declaration. Be honest with Jesus about your faith or lack thereof, about your doubts. What you can ask him is to overcome your unbelief. That gap between where it seems like uh, this is right on the line. It's kind of belief, but it's kind of unbelief. I want to get over that, that line, wherever that line is that, that seems to be, that it's invisible, yet you feel it because doubt is a feeling of uncertainty. And maybe certainty isn't even the point. Maybe it's more that he can help you overcome that barrier. 
Remember that man at the beginning, that story Craig Rochelle shared of they prayed against this, this place of evil. Lightning hit it. The bar owner believed that it was caused by the people praying. And the pastor's like, no, we didn't expect God to do anything. Please don't pray against bars and we don't need to be sued. And That's not an email I need to receive tomorrow. But I love this resurrection language. Again, verse 27 for me is, if the other one doesn't move you a little bit, this one should, but Jesus took him by the hand. They had said he's dead. He's lying there. It seemed like that, that spirit or that illness had taken him down. He's beyond repair. What can you do now, Jesus? But Jesus took him by the hand, helped him up to his feet, and he stood up. That's resurrection language. And what I love about this is that Jesus helped the father by raising the son. You don't hear from the Father again. I wish we could hear. And then what did the Father say? You helped me overcome my unbelief. I don't know what he would say. What do you think he would say? And so as we unpack things this summer, I just find it so fascinating that the more I read through this, the more I notice new things, the more that it's, it's like the suitcase of, we see the, the structure of the story. We see the general point. Probably a child could understand it. Yet, the more we look at it, the more it's like, can we unpack and look at the contents here? What is actually happening? There's something going on between the, the large crowd and the teachers and the disciples. There's something going on there. There's something going on between this, this father and the situation. And he, he just was looking for help for his son. And then there's this situation where... He's asking Jesus to help, but is he believing that Jesus will do something or can do something? If you can, would you help us? He's pleading with them, but he, does he know? We're not sure. It seems like he wants to believe that, but he can't. But could Jesus help him? And then the boy who he had been struggling with this for so long, all of a sudden, once again, the thing that was trying to kill him, the thing that was trying to destroy him, seemed like it did right in front of Jesus so that the people all thought, he's dead. You made it worse. But Jesus. And so as I unpack this, I'm encouraged. As I unpack this, I want to know more. I want to go deeper with this. And so I believe that there's more for next week and Maybe there's some things you'll ponder today and, and throughout this week. And when the disciples asked a question privately with Jesus afterward, they were probably like, there's nothing we can say now. We're argued out. We've just been kind of thrown under the bus by the people, the Father. We were no help here. Jesus, you, you did it all. But we have a question. Why couldn't we cast out that evil spirit? And Jesus replied, this kind can be cast out only by prayer. And many manuscripts also say in fasting, prayer and fasting. They went from this mountain top to this valley low, but Jesus was with them throughout to help. We're going to call the team back here to lead us in a final song. And maybe you relate most with the Father. I do believe, but Help me overcome my unbelief. Well, I would ask, where, what do you believe? What do you trust that he can do? Not the if, but what do you believe? For me, it's I do believe that he can reverse destruction. Even things that seem like they're beyond repair, I believe that he can reconstruct them. He can resurrect us. I do believe that even if a person is dead, if they have faith in him, he can reach down, take them by the hand, lift them up to their feet so that they can stand up. I believe that resurrection is an important theme in this passage. And so as we continue to unpack, would you be honest with your faith as you pray between just you and the Lord? Father, I thank you for this passage and 
as difficult as it might feel those who have been in a similar situation as this father and son, we ask you to have mercy on us and help us. And instead of finishing that sentence with, if you can, it would be, if, if you will, if you're willing. And so although my faith, my belief in you might seem so small that you could call it unbelief, would you help me still? But would you help me by overcoming my unbelief so that I trust in you in a deeper way? Not to understand everything, but when I feel like things are uncertain, may I be, may I be certain at least about you. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.